of here and also a proud member. It's my pleasure to welcome you and to introduce our speaker today, Chief Executive of the Donaldson Adoption Institute, April Dinwoody. Before I get into this, let me acknowledge that it may seem strange that today, just four days after a historic election, we're talking about adoption, but there's a few reasons why. One, we anticipated that at this point people may be um, exhausted by the campaign and the election and need something else to think about, something completely different, and uh, that may in fact be the case. Um, two, we've all been reminded that as important as this election is, there is still work to be done in so many areas that were never mentioned during the campaign and seldom get mentioned at all in the context of national politics. And part of our job here at, the Citadel, at this Citadel of Free Speech is to provide a platform for issues and perspectives that don't often get heard but are vitally important. November is National Adoption Awareness Month, an annual campaign to raise awareness for children and youth in foster care who are waiting for permanent families. And right now, more than 107,000 children are currently in foster care. While this awareness campaign is only two decades old, the formal legal practice of adoption dates back to the 1850s when Massachusetts, when Massachusetts passed what is considered to be the first modern adoption law. Since then, adoption has evolved and changed with society, moving from a, a secretive and often stigmatized process to one that is more open and widely recognized as not only a viable way to build a family, but an important act that can make the world a little better, one parent-child relationship at a time. Of course, it's not that simple, nor always that straightforward. Movements around feminism, LGBTQ equality, and civil rights, along with an increased acceptance of single mother-led households and interracial and interethnic families, have also helped contribute to the trend of increased adoption. But still, as that figure cited above, 107,000 children in foster care, there's still work to be done. And for children who remain in the foster system and age out, the work is even more challenging, although it's a different set of work that needs to be done there. And I'm sure we'll discuss that, but let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. Ms. Dean Woody is a nationally recognized leader on adoption and foster care. As the chief executive of Donaldson Adoption Institute, she works to change laws, policies, and practices through research, education, education and advocacy. She's also co-founder of Fostering Change for Children, a progressive nonprofit that helps drive innovation in the child welfare system. Before joining Donaldson, Ms. Dinwoody created a specialized mentoring program called Adoptment, in which adults who were adopted or spent time in foster care serve as mentors to youth in care. And as a transracially adopted person herself, she shares her experiences at workshops and conferences to help potential adoptive parents and professionals understand the beauty and complexity of adopting children of another race. Before she entered the nonprofit world, Ms. Dinwoody served as a senior executive within the, marketing, within the marketing and communications departments of some of the most recognized brands in the world, including Nine West, Kenneth Cole, Nautica, J.C. Penney, and JetBlue. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming April Dinwoody. Good afternoon. Um, I am so happy to be warmly welcomed here. It's an honor and a privilege, uh, one that I don't take lightly, and one that especially now feels uh, more special, more important. So I'm grateful for all of you in this room, and I'm grateful for the warm welcome that I received. Um, you know, a special thanks to City Club of Cleveland and to Stephanie Jansky for all that she did, along with the, the team here, to make this a successful event. Uh, also a heartfelt thank you to Betsy Norris and her team at Adoption Network Cleveland, who are fierce advocates for adoption today and just uh, a heartwarming group of people to be around. I've spent some time with them this, this week. And I can't think of a more important or poignant time to have a conversation with you about adoption in America today. November became National Adoption Month under the Clinton administration more than two decades ago, expanding from the week-long celebration it had been. The idea was to highlight the need for families uh, for 100 plus thousand children waiting for foster care for adoption, which is a laudable goal considering that many of these children in foster care today are older. Uh, Today, National Adoption Month is actually expanded. Uh, it encompasses more of the voices of the adoption experience and the extended family of adoption, highlighting the diverse experiences and the realities. Uh, November is also when we celebrate Thanksgiving. And I think we can all agree that for many of us on the 24th, as we spend time with family, we'll be reflecting on what family really means to all of us. 
uh, the uh, honoring our families today actually means that we can't just talk about it trans transactionally. We celebrate all the parts of it, the complexity and the beauty and the joy. And we see how uh, when we do this, it can be an evolved view of all of our families. Uh, over the last few decades, the definition of family has expanded and evolved. It spans different races, classes, cultures, includes step, adoptive, foster, LGBTQ families, and those that were formed with third party reproduction. However, the laws and policies and practices for these families have not kept up. Family is family, regardless of how they're formed, and they all deserve to be happy, healthy, and strong. Regardless of how your family is formed, and even when they're reminding us of our most embarrassing moments, family is the foundation of our humanity. Under the best of circumstances, maintaining family connections that are healthy is challenging and requires understanding, thoughtfulness, and patience. This is even more so for the extended family of adoption. With members of the adoption community representing approximately less than 4% of the population, adoption is often seen as a niche issue, and many fail to recognize the bigger, more complex societal issues that, and the very real notion that uh, the definition of family is evolving. Too often, discussions and behavior surrounding adoption have centered on the competing interests of adults, not what's best for children. When we mindfully address the issues related to adoption, this can be part of a broader mandate to really strengthen all families and regain family values with a modern sensibility. Adoption is not a niche issue at all, and 60% of Americans actually talk about an indirect connection to adoption through friends, families, other families that have adopted or adopted people themselves. And this community actually grows exponentially when we think about birth families who are so often always left out of the conversation around adoption. So adoption is all around us. Since 1971, I have had a very personal connection to adoption. In October of that year, my biological mother entered Boston Lying in Hospital in Massachusetts. On the 27th, I was born. On the 29th, she left the hospital and I entered temporary foster care. Nearly eight months after that, I joined the Dinwiddie family in Rhode Island in a foster to adopt placement. And in 1973, I was legally adopted. I spent the last 45 years being fiercely loved by them and fiercely loving them right back. I've also spent the better part of the last 20 years searching for connections to my family of origin and information about my beginnings, genetics, and family health history. Since 1996, the Donaldson Adoption Institute, or DAI, has worked to improve the lives of children and families through research, education, and advocacy. We investigate the issues that are of greatest concern to expectant parents, adoptive parents, birth parents, and the families that extend to them, and the professionals who serve them. Our pioneering work has, has ranged from how to eliminate barriers from foster care to the impact of the internet on adoption to policies and perceptions surrounding expectant and birth families. In 2013, after many years in corporate marketing, I began work at DAI just shy of the 20th anniversary. The first matter of business to understand was the impact of our work. And after analyzing 40 publications, 180 recommendations, and that's just from DAI, what I had to ask myself and what we had to ask ourselves was, um, why haven't policies and practice advanced and moved far enough, fast enough? We started a, a movement, really, um, because it was no longer a matter of knowing what to do. Our research tells us what we need to do. It was a matter of understanding where our perceptions are and then moving forward in an, in an organized way to help understand and unravel what's happening in adoption today. And, and right now, as we all feel, I think, our work in this area feels more urgent than ever. Uh, with all that in mind, DAI launched uh, Let's Adopt Reform, which is a a movement really, an initiative and a play on words, quite frankly, um, to start a national conversation about adoption in the 21st century. Uh, we conducted qualitative research on a, 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 with a wide range of professionals, and we did one of the biggest qualitative research projects in this area to date. We set out on a national town hall, hall and we tackled tough issues, explored opportunities, shared life experiences, and asked the tough questions. We arrived at several themes that we think are the bedrock of adoption reform moving forward. Adoption is not a one-time transaction. We must recognize the basic human rights of everyone in the extended family of adoption. Children are not commodities. 
adoption in, the, in this country lacks uniformity. And last but not least, there will be no reform without, without education. First, we must acknowledge that adoption is not a one-time transaction, but rather a transformational journey for everyone involved. Although a day that a parent finalizes an adoption with a child is a powerful one, adoption will always be more than one moment in time. We must recognize this as the starting place. Throughout National Adoption Month, you're gonna see headlines and there will be heartwarming stories of the finalizations of adoption. This is a powerful thing and it's important. But we also have to acknowledge that the day that the legal mechanism that cements adoption happens is that one day and there is so much more to, th to think about and to, uh, to experience. There is a vital need to candidly consider the many different elements that create adoption, those that warm our hearts and some that may not. Recognizing that families need support is at the heart of all of this, and that is really about pre- and post-adoption services. In 2014, DAI analyzed publicly funded post-adoption services in this country, and the truth is only a handful of states actually require this. And 17 states were rated as, as good and substantial, and at least 13 states had absolutely no support at all. So pre-adoption services vary by state and different numbers of requirements of, of, of education pre happens from 27 hours for foster care to 10 hours for intercountry adoption. But the truth is there has to be some standardization of this and that is all about the, the, the more than the one day and the one time transaction. For expectant parents who are considering adoption, it's essential that they have access to unbiased, non-coercive options counseling so they know the full range of their options. Prospective adoptive parents must also receive comprehensive educational training and supports when, and, and include the, the idea of gains and losses. The availability of post-adoption services requires laws to change and funding to be available. And lastly, if we are to mandate these, report, these, these supports, professionals that deliver them must be educated. Next, we have to recognize the basic human rights and everyone has in the extended family of adoption. Adoption is in urgent need of a cultural shift, and that requires us first and foremost to make decisions and adoption through the lens of human rights and practice adoption in ways that primarily and fundamentally respect and uphold humanity of all who are connected to it. Too often, adoption is handled like a business transaction. And we, when this happens, the extended family of adoption is objectified. Working to ensure transparency in adoption means parents, expectant, first birth, and adoptive are well informed and prepared. This includes allowing, also includes allowing adopted people and allowing them access to the original birth certificates and knowledge of their, of their origins. 69% of Americans believe that adopted people should have access to their records and their birth certificates, and this should be made available to people. But due to state laws, so many of us are denied that fundamental right even after we turn 18. Most people are a mess when they lose their cell phones. Imagine what it would be to lose a part of your identity permanently. Similarly, openness and adoption is a healthier way to act, and we are building relationships with families and, and acting with openness today, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Three in five Americans believe that it's good for adopted people to stay in contact with their families of origin and keep communication. A quality adoption also means that prospective adoptive parents should be evaluated on their qualifications, not their sexual orientation or any other aspect of their humanity that has no bearing on their ability to love and nurture a child. Another element of human rights is something that's been known as rehoming, which is the illegal and unregulated child custody transfer of children, adopted children. A 2013 Reuters investigation analyzed ads placed through Yahoo, a group known as then as Adopting from Disruption. And from 2007 to 2012, the report indicates that 261 ads were posted advertising children to be removed from one family to another without legal oversight. Most of these children, 70% that were advertised, were adopted from other countries. 8% had been born into the U.S., and the other 22% we don't know. Rehoming occurs outside of the court and the legal child welfare system, so there are no formal statistics kept, and we don't know how to ascertain how many children this impacts each year. This practice, though, without any legal oversight, has led to consequences for kids and exemplifies the worst that can happen when there aren't appropriate checks and balances in place, including a robust, robust system of post-adoption services, 
Even one child rehomed is one child too many. Next, hard to hear, hard to look at, subtle references in my slides which look at uh, different price tags on babies. Children are not commodities. Money is necessary, it's complicated to talk about, and it's even more complicated to talk about when we put it next to adoption. Over the last several decades, the institution of adoption has arguably become more of a business versus the social service to place children in need of permanent families. Although adoptions do occur ethically, the reality is that money and market forces have distorted adoption and created practices that are conducted like commercial transactions. This reality can leave parents expectant, birth, and adoptive open to possibility of coercion and emotional despair and make adopted people feel like commodities. Since these rules and regulations vary by state, aspects of the adoption process, including fees, differ, and it's difficult to know exactly uh, how much is being charged for adoption, but there are some, some patterns. Uh, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Child Welfare Information Gateway, we estimate that there are a range of costs, including zero to 2,500 for foster care adoption, 5,000 to 40,000 plus for an adoption through a licensed private agency, 8,000 to 40,000 plus for an independent adoption, such as with an attorney, and 15,000 to 30,000 plus for an intercountry adoption. Although adoption has historically carried with it this idea of a charitable act, a notion that is laden with various stereotypes, it is also an assumption that stands in sharp contrast to what happens today with adoption commanding very high fees. Also, we can't deny that so often birth parents sat a la cite a lack of resources and support for voluntarily relinquishing their children. This marketplace that undeniably exists privileges some over others and distorts the essence of what family is really and should be about. More than 75% of the adoption community believes that money and privilege distort adoption. More research in this area is needed and we have to know how this is impacting our experience today before we can draft sound proposals for the ethics around adoption policies. It's imperative that statutes are created which formally and strictly regulate the fees that can be paid towards adoption. No agency or entity should be allowed to base fee structures on race, ethnic background, or needs of a child. When money is equated with specifically to the child's characteristics, it's difficult to argue that the fee is not for the services, but rather the child. Providing incentives for adoption from foster care is actually an important endeavor, but money should never be an impediment for a family seeking to become parents for a waiting child, nor should it be a reason for a child to be removed from a family. We must also create policies that incentivize the creation of of, and provisions for evidence-based services to preserve families when appropriate and safe for children. Similarly, expectant parents considering their options surrounding an unintended pregnancy must always be provided with all of the information that exists for parenting their child, including the financial supports. Adoption in this country lacks uniformity. The inconsistency in policies that vary widely by state can lead to fraud, coercion, and undue stress on families and children. Domestic adoption is guided by state law and intercountry adoption guided by varying laws on the child's, based on the child's country of origin and also whether a country is party to the Hague Convention. With domestic adoption policies, regulation practices can also differ vastly. This leaves things like the home study requirements, services to expected parents, and post-placement supervision all over the map. 75% of the general public support a greater regulation for adoption and foster care. At the same time, research shows that the public did not place a high importance on the urgency of the issue. There will be no reform without education. One of the greatest impediments to meaningful reforms in adoption and foster care are the societal misperceptions and general lack of knowledge surrounding the realities. This has plagued families and individuals for decades, in some cases holding families back from healthy and fulfilling experiences and others impeding the well-being and contributing to serious, serious challenges. People connected to adoption represent just one of the ma many challenging and changing dynamics in family today. Non-traditional is the new traditional in today's modern world, with a definition of family continuing to expand. What remains problematic? Policies and practices that have not kept up with the reality of families, and that fact continues to negatively impact those closest to adoption and foster care. 
All children and families come into contact with many different systems, schools, healthcare systems. When these providers fail to have an education and create an inclusive environment for these diverse families, the needs are left unmet and children and families are left to feel isolated and unsupported. What also fuels this lack of knowledge are the stereotypes perpetuated in the media and popular culture, which often highlight the dramatic fairy tale or the cautionary nightmare. The reality of this experience is many more shades of gray, with most of us dwelling somewhere in between. Yet the headlines and made-for-TV movie plots increase stigma and misunderstanding. This makes it extremely difficult to advance the needed policy changes we know must happen and ultimately hurt children and families. DIA's public opinion research revealed that adoption reform is a highly supported issue, yet 60%, 61% of Americans admit they don't know much about it and how it works. And when given a very basic quiz about adoption, the general public and those closest to adoption received an average score of a C-. It's essential that we create ample spaces for members of the adoption community to share realities as well and a means of, as a means for overcoming stigma perpetuated by unrealistic depictions of foster care and adoption. We must address the stigmatizing depictions in the media, on television, and in the movies. Professionals must be better educated about the unique needs of adoption and foster care communities in order to better serve them in school, at the doctor, even in the criminal justice system. We have to understand much more needs to be done about building a stronger community within the adoption space and within, with us closest to the experience. We have to stand shoulder to shoulder in order to show ourselves and make sure that policies change. What's the state of America, adoption in America today? Well, it, it depends, honestly. It depends on where you live because laws vary widely state by state. It depends on who you love because we, even with a win for marriage equality, the, the rights of the LGBT community are not always recognized. It depends on how much money you have because the private and public adoption systems are really worlds apart. It depends on where you, your adoption journey began, in foster care, private adoption, or country, uh, inter-country adoption, private domestic, with, it, with an attorney. It depends on how adoption has impacted you as a birth parent, an adoptive parent, an adopted person, or an extended mem member of this community. It depends on whether or not you view adoption as a one-time transaction or a lifelong transformational journey. Families and professionals today have an amazing ability to provide an adoption experience that isn't shrouded in secrecy or tainted with shame. When we honor the good, acknowledge the bad, and then we use what we know to commit and innovate an effective path to reform, we can ensure the highest ethical standards with openness, mindful parent preparation, and healthy identity development for everyone. It's time we move from the fractured and transactional adoption process to one that's more uniform and transformational. Bringing a child into a family, whether by birth, adoption, or the blending of families, is life-changing for everyone. When we recognize the lifelong impact and put children at the center, adoption can truly represent the evolved definition of family. This holiday season, as you reflect on your families, remember, adoption isn't just about someone else's family. It's about all of our families. And our families, when they're strong, will build stronger communities. And those communities will make a better world for us. Our commitment to children and families being strong feels more urgent than ever before. So let's make it a priority. Let's face the bad with insight and courage. And let's celebrate the good every day in every way possible. Being here with you today is a true honor and a gift, and I hope it has created a little space for us to think about our world as it, as it relates to our center of gravity as our families and how important these families will be as we march forward over this next time. I'm grateful for the opportunity, and um, we're happy to take your questions. Today we are enjoying a Friday Forum in the middle of National Adoption Month with April Din, it's Dinwoody. Dinwoody. Where, where's, the, where's the emphasis, Woody or Din? Din, Din. Din. Mm. Mm. Okay, anyway, <laughs> Chief Executive, I felt like I mispronounced it, um, Chief Executive of the, of the Donaldson Adoption Institute. We're about to begin our audience, the traditional audience Q&A, and we welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our radio broadcast, webcast, or our new live simulcast at the Parma Snow Branch of the Cuyahoga County Public Library. 
all of which is made possible through our partnership with IdeaStream, that's 90.3 WCPN, which is our NPR affiliate, WVIZ-PBS, and WCLV. If you'd like to tweet a question because you're not in the room and you can't ask the question yourself, we welcome that. Or if you're in the room and you'd prefer to remain silent and just tweet it, you can tweet it at the City Club and our team will work it into the program. We want to remind you your questions should be brief and to the point, which goes without saying with Twitter, but um, is more important for the rest of you here in the room. Holding our microphones today are our content coordinator, Teddy Eisenberg, and director of programming, Stephanie Jansky. May we have our first question, please? The, the drama of adoption points to the drama of creating a family ever. Uh, it's such a complex matter, and you've sketched that vividly. I think it will always be enormously difficult and complex. One of the things that you touched on that does seem to me to be in transition, and I would really welcome whatever wisdom your experience and empirical data has begun to bring to this question. And that is, at what point in an adoptee's life should an adoptee have legally supported rights mm -hmm. to go back and uh, find uh, birth data? Uh, and uh, there, there's so many rights competing here, the rights of the adoptee, the rights of a of a birth family that might want some degree of, of secrecy or confidentiality, mm -hmm. and the rights of the adopting family, There's, and the rights of society in general for sort of clarity in these issues, simplicity. So I would really welcome hearing from you what is the, the, the prevailing wisdom of those who study this question and who work in the field. Hmm. Powerful question. Thank you for that. So. I'll start with my personal, because I think that's, uh, in some ways, the right way, to, the right place to start for me anyway. Um, I believe in the truth, okay? So at, at, at whatever point that feels, um, uh, it feels at the beginning. I think operating from, from a place of truth and giving the people in most close to this involved the support that they need, research has shown that when, uh, an expectant parent and a birth parent have good counseling and good support, they can make a decision that doesn't feel like it has to be shrouded in secrecy or tainted with shame, and, and they can be connected to their children. This is new. This is something new we're working on. We're still unraveling the years when it was uh, the closed adoption error, which was no information whatsoever, which is my personal experience, and that has created such a, a challenging dynamic, most, most so for the adopted person who feels the divided loyalty when they want to search, the pathology around knowing who you are, uh, and then for the adoptive parents, I mean, I don't think you set parents up for success when you don't allow them to speak the truth to their children. Uh, this can be the, the truth on, on many levels, and we're seeing this in assisted reproductive technology today with donor egg and donor sperm, uh, where we have to center and begin on truth. We've, uh, we're unraveling the past on that, so I would say it's, it's still a work in progress to really know exactly uh, now when we've got still this movement to open records from the closed system. Um, but today I think we have the opportunity to start with the truth for everyone. Uh, and that, to me, feels like the most important place to begin. Can I just ask for a tiny clarification on whether the age of the adoptee is a critical factor in determining when a, a, a child should be able to go pursue this truth? Well, I think every child is, is different, right? Um, and their development uh, is different. I think you can. There are a lot of amazing professionals and parents that, that know how to discuss challenging topics with children that are as age appropriate. But I think today um, that you start now with your children at whatever age they are. Um, if you haven't been talking about it since day one, which is you know the best for everyone, and I don't remember when my parents told me that I was adopted. That's something they did very artfully and skillfully and organically. Um, a child shouldn't remember that day. Uh, it should be organically baked in. So when the absence of that, um, start today as a family, uh, get educated as a, as a parent and get the support that you need for how this may happen 
you know, and, and, and unfold with your child. Um, but I, I say that generally the time is now and make sure you have support around you so that, uh, because later isn't better. Uh, later isn't better. We, we see this in our research. It says, it, you know, it points to um, the importance of the truth. And some people have come to us much later in life with their adult children that they haven't told and asking us what to do. So um, we know that people are coming into these realities and really, really not knowing what to do. So um, it, it, there's no exact age that I could say, but I say if you haven't told your kids, start figuring out how to tell them today um, and, fi and, and do what's best for your family to get the support that you need. Ms. Dittmaria, over here. Oh, hi. Hello. Uh, you've talked about the difference in state laws governing adoption. You've advocated for not only transparency, but uniformity. Now, I can't resist the question, seeing as we've just had an election here, of an administration that is probably going to be very committed to keeping government out of our lives. And that leads me to the question of what action uh, is presently pending that has any hope of bringing this uniformity, mm -hmm. first of all, on the federal level, mm -hmm. which I rather doubt, and secondly, there is something uh, called the, uh, I forget the name, the uh, uniformity in state laws. Is there any action uh, currently pending that might bring some uniformity across the country to state laws motivated by state action? Mm -hmm. Sure. So that's a great question. And I think, you know, when you, when you talk about things the way I did today, it's, it's got to be up here. And, you know, what we've learned over the course of time in doing some of this work is that, you know, there's a lot of steps to getting to some of this uniformity and that there's not going to be a light switch that goes off that says, okay, we have uniform standard now, now, standards now in adoption. It's, just, it's not a realistic idea, but it's one that we have to talk about in, you know, as, a, as a concept. With that, uh, there are pieces and parts of the, of the process in adoption that I think can be more uniform as a starting place. And one of those things is a universal home study. And that's, fe that's on the federal level, um, which would help to at least the, the part of the process make that more uniform and make that something that right now, if you have a private domestic adoption, you do that with an attorney, your home study could be, look, and it will look very different usually than an, an, a home study for a foster care placement. So w those two things have to, have to come closer to one another, and we have to have the same experience and the same criteria for parents across the board. So that's one thing. And there is um, the Home Study Act that has been introduced, but everything will recalibrate now, right? So there are pieces and parts to move. And when that gets in, in you know, embedded, and if we can do that, then that li leaves way for other things that we can do as part of this process. It's going to be bits and pieces. It's not going to be the whole thing. So that's what, one answer. And then on the state level, um, because states have um, closed and open ad adoption records over time, that's where you see a lot of action around um, state activity today in adoption is working to advocate for those state laws to change so that adopted people can have access to their original birth certificates. So there's one of a forward-looking, you know, sort of federal mandates, and then local in terms of um, uh, access to records. And then there's also the idea of uh, post-adoption services, and that varies state by state as well. So, you know, I think about this idea that... Um, you know, states are going to still have to, you know, implement what, what happens. And, and that may be slightly different in regulations and all those different things that happen within um, our, our law system. But um, I think there's some good starting places. And I, I hope, I hope and pray that we can pick up some of that momentum that we had. But it's going to be piecemeal. It's not going to be sweeping, sweeping changes that we would love to see. But well, that's okay. We're, our movement is, like I say, in its teen years, right? We just figure, we're, we're getting our identity uh, in place. We don't, we don't really know who we are exactly um, in terms of a, a movement. We're, we've got to solidify some of our solidarity and then move some of this forward. But there's a lot of, of great, hopeful things that are in the works. 
Thank you for coming today. Uh, as a fa my family is a transracial uh, adopt adoptive family, and I was wondering if you could give some tips to me and others in the room who I know uh, are in the same experience. Especially, I think of someone like Colin Kaepernick, who you know that's a whole uh, <laughs> ball of wax that we don't need to unravel. However, uh, when he made his statement, um, people told him he wasn't black, hmm. and um, I took offense to that for mm -hmm. him. So could you speak to that? I, I really want it for my children. Mm -hmm. I apologize to be emotional. Mm -hmm. But I don't want that world for my kid. I know, I know you don't have the answer to that. Well, <laughs> I do have thoughts on this, though. Um, so I do a workshop called What My White Parents Didn't Know and Why It Turned Out Okay Anyway. <laughs> and it speaks to the over time, in my, my time as a transracially adopted person, um, it, 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 ta it talks us through that. But then you arrive at a place like today, and I had a very, very emotional conversation with my mother about an article I wrote about seeing color and adoption and why that's important. We wanted to live in a space, and they wanted, my family wanted a space, and that um, you're not, you know, color, we don't see color. So when I walk outside of this family, people see color, okay? And I need a safe place to come in this family. I can't be one person in my family system and another person outside of my family system. And I'm coming into my racial identity at this late stage of the game, right? Tr truly embracing that and, and being vocal about things. And now on top of it, I couldn't think of a more empowering time to do that because I have to be settled in my racial identity because the world is dangerous emotionally and physically for people of color. And this is not about going to the, and, and, and operating within this transactional way of, oh, we went to this parade, we did this. It's very novel. You have to embrace differences of race, class, and culture in your family of adoption like it's your business, okay? And oh, we can't keep sending our children out into the world unprepared to deal with what they will no doubt face in this world today. And the, the hopeful side of all this, because I think there are, many examples of this working, and quite frankly, I think my family has figured out how to do this, and we are still figuring it out, and loving each other, and trying to manage through some very painful Colin Kaepernick situations, okay? So we are uniquely designed as these families to actually talk about this in a, in a productive way, because it's urgent for us. Okay, we have to do it. So I think there's, it's becoming this like thing is happening and we, you know, I never thought it would be harder today to be in a transracially adopted life than it was when I was born into it in 1971, and it is. So we're not, you know, we've gotta, we've gotta move forward and it's gonna be hard, it's gonna be emotional. Start with yourself, look in the mirror, say the words we don't like to say hear them fall on your ear so when your kid comes home and says, someone said that to me, you, you are ready to, to hear that? Because it's going to happen. Say them out loud. Have conversations about race daily, regularly, in your family, outside of your family. Make it a part of you. Because if you don't, you'll be faced with the rest of the world that's coming into your conspicuous family uninvited to help you figure it out. And you'll want that. You won't be ready for that. Thank you very much for <clears throat> reintroducing a very challenging subject. I had an opportunity in the 1970s to deal with this issue in the Ohio legislature. And our big approach at that point was to try to convert the independent adoption into a, 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 a public adoption mm -hmm. so that you had the public supervision and the public regulation of the, what essentially was a private process. But one thing that we never could figure out was what happens when the arrangement for the private adoption is made uh, before the uh, person is born, and the birth does not turn out well. Mm. It was a, one of the more tragic situations that we heard, you know, firsthand several times. Sure. Has any progress been made over the last 40 years in that difficult subject? Uh, um, well, uh, first and foremost, I don't think an adoption should be ever arranged before a child is born. Um, we don't know as individuals uh, how our lives will change dramatically upon giving birth to a baby. So, and there should be time and space 
for that decision to be sol so solid. And that means that for adoptive parents out there, you know, you have to go into the situation educated and professionals need to help us understand that what we are walking through, because it is doable, it's workable, but we've often had this, we don't want to talk down into the details or feel these feelings of that anxiety of what will happen. Um, I would say, very little process, progress has happened in that area, if, I, if I'm honest, because um, when you do, when you have still the instance of private adoption that that can be the do-it-yourself model, which is taking advantage of our, our internet today and and having an attorney and saying we're looking for a family, you look, you know, when you, and then there's no supervision and oversight in that. That's where the real challenge comes because there can be coercion, there can be fraud, there can also be major, major disappointment and devastation on both sides for the birth parent and the adoptive parent when we haven't sort of, I, I would love to see uh, that move, us move to, you know, a, a system where the private adoption system really oversees all adoption um, and really reinforcing that and, and taking into consideration all the things we just talked about today to fuel that forward because there, there isn't enough progress and it's stuff we don't like to talk about, you know? Um, we don't talk, like to talk about um, sex and babies and things that happen, you know, we don't. And then that really makes it difficult for us to really treat this with the care um, that it needs to have. But I appreciate your work when you were doing it and um, I wish we had come much further and I could tell you something different today. Hi. Again, thank you for being here today. I'm a, an adoptive parent that created a multi-ethnic family through adoption, and I'm also a professional that's worked with both um, domestic adoption through the foster care system and international adoption. And one of my concerns that I think is really quite ironic is that we are limited in, limited in the amount of training that we can give to parents who are adopting domestically. Um, particularly through the public system, in terms of dealing with the issues that are incumbent in raising a complex family due to racial and ethnic differences. Whereas in international adoption, we are permitted and expected to provide that kind of training. Do you have some guidance as to how to manage those ironies? Sure. It's, it's really a concern because... Um, some of the laws that are in place surrounding that are really about not impeding an adoption based on race. It doesn't mean, doesn't say that you can't have the conversations about it. It has been interpreted and people act on it in that way, but it, 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 impeding an adoption by talking about race, is, you know what I'm impeding it, you're not impeding an adoption by talking about race, class, and culture. You're actually fortifying the, the whole idea and the process and educating parents so they can make good decisions with, with good information. So I think we've, 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 we've come into this belief that you can't do that, quite frankly, in a lot of cases, because it's sometimes easier to not. When, when the paperwork that I read uh, came with me um, and my parents uh, were, talk, were being told about a baby being available, me, um, she might be of mixed race. And in the paperwork, it says there is a, you know, there's a chance because of some, you know, some genetic things. The geneticist said that she may be um, a child of mixed race, but she, they wouldn't say whether or not that was true. And of course, it was true, and I still am. And, <laughs> but it gave what it, that what that set up many years ago was the uh, we don't have to have this conversation about race today with some of the laws that exist. You can't impede the adoption because of it, but it doesn't mean you can't talk about it. That's where we, but there's limited number of hours that you're required, so how much do you fit into that time? There are some great agencies and places today that are digging into this topic and going above and beyond, and I think we're all sort of uh, trying to figure it out, but we shouldn't be left to our own devices like that. We should have the support from the professionals, and we should have the ability to have these conversations, which will impact a family over the course of uh, the lifetime, and it will go like this depending on where we are culturally. And if we look at it today, we, 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 we can't not be talking about it. I have a transgender grandchild, so I'm very interested in the welfare of transgender mm -hmm. kids. They need a lot of love and support. Mm -hmm. And uh, statistically, thinking of those thousands and thousands of children in foster care, some of them must be transgender. And I, I wonder if you can just comment on the special issues there. Sure. 
it's um, a topic that is, is becoming so much a part of the dialogue today, as rightly it should. Um, my experience has been um, working with young people in foster care, um, you know, and I think it centers so much on identity, right? Um, and I keep saying the healthy identity development of children requires the healthy identity development of adults uh, that are working in closely attached to children, be they their parents, their school teachers, their... Um, so I think with the issue of transgender, there's, first of all, um, this identity exploration with young people in foster care and also adopted people, this idea of exploring your identity, which means sometimes we are more interested in really exploring and getting to the heart of who we are. Um, and sometimes that means there's, there's uh, transgender, there's uh, uh, you know, sexual orientation, what you, you know, what you, who you want to love and how you want to love and, and all this. So I think it's a... It's particularly important to have spaces where young people who are, are really exploring their identity in these areas have to go. There's some great places in, um, in New York by me that are really just safe spaces for people to come and be in community, but then also they're inv people are invited in, the professionals are invited in, parents are invited in to be in conversation about you know, this, this new frontier that we're all embarking on with our children at the center, but no less important for us to look in the mirror and talk about and say transgender, say, talk about these things out loud so when they come into our space, we're not jarred and we can and be in support of them. So it's a, that's a, a very important and um, not just about transgender, but identity, looking at identity overall. You're a great grandma. <laughs> Great grandma, <laughs> not great grandma. Okay. You've answered part of this, I suppose, in talking about some of the more uh, difficult issues of transgender and so on. Um, I'm wondering if there are any standards or how frequently we find them uh, about investigating the health history of the parents and keeping the adopted parents and the adoptee informed as those d issues develop. Um, there certainly might be genetic and other family traits that they would be well advised to know about in advance in terms of preventive uh, actions and so on. Sure. Well, you know, again, over time, we've gone from this, um, and, and I think there's a lot of dynamics that, inf that inform where we are today. So it was some really good, exciting opportunities, and then some historical practices that have been about um, and my friend Leslie Pate McKinnon says this, so I'm borrowing it from her, um, amputating a child from one family system and then grafting them onto another and, and, and not taking into consideration um, what we now are much more informed uh, about today, which is family health history, um, things that present when uh, you're in your young adulthood and, and many mental health issues that don't present until later in life, that you need to have that extended family history in order to um, make sure that you're well informed and that you have the best information you can. We are getting better at that in this country, right? More proactive in our health. At the same time, we struggle with figuring out exactly how that would work and should work. Um, you know, should there be a, a short form birth certificate and then a long form that talks about medical, family medical health history? Um, it particularly related to intercountry adoption where there's a lot more mystery with where a child was before they entered into the adoption experience and, and so many more um, acute issues that come with being in, uh, in, in um, care in, in, in an orphanage, let's say. So um, we, it's, it's on the radar, but we're, we're, not, we're not sure exactly um, what, what makes the most sense in terms of how to deliver this and what access points. I say again, at the very beginning of this should be the time where you're getting as much information as, as you can possible. And then, you know, over time, there should be a place to always go, especially considering the, the fees that adoption come in. You should have, you should be able to walk back into any agency and get more information and get support and get the counseling that you need in order to, and connections to birth family, right? So um, it's, it's of great importance now. And, 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 then, and then there's DNA testing, right? I just did my DNA testing. I am part European, 60%, and part West African. How cool is that? I've never known that until now. So we have the ability now with all these innovative um, 
<laughs> elements. So let's say, let's just say, it's not a good idea, but let's just say we don't want to have more open and transparency at the beginning. We can, we can get at some of the genetics and DNA through our testing, and that should just be in tandem with what we know from a family health history that's given to us. Now, I know some families don't, that, are adop that are not adopted and have adoption in their experience don't talk about family health history. You know, so um, we have a long way to go with that, but I think there's advancement coming um, with that, and and a, and a new and a renewed or a new spirit of wanting to know what we're made up of and how and identity, both as our personalities, but also our health. Hi. Hi. Occasionally, uh, adopt children are adopted, and then it doesn't work out with the adopted fam adopted family, and they return the child which is devastating for the child. Uh, I've heard a lot in what you said today that addresses how that can be prevented, but could you specifically talk to how that can be addressed, prevented, and when that happens, what can be done for those children? Sure. So uh, it, it's like the steady drumbeat of education, education, education. I, I liken it to surgery, right? When you go into a, a, an elective surgery or a, or a needed surgery, um, or you take a medication, you'll say, okay, here are the things, you're gonna get the surgery, here are the things we know might happen. We are now at a point in time where with research and lived experiences and uh, we actually know what things could happen. There's a higher instances of seeking therapy for adopted people. We have, you know, there's a higher instances of learning disabilities. We are overrepresented in residential treatment facilities. You know, we know that, now not every family has that, you know, um, experience and every young person that's adopted. So by no means are we saying this is across the board, but when, when a parent enters into this experience, knowing that some of these things may happen and then giving them the support systems and access to those things that when they need to tap into them, it's, it's, it's that, but it's also unraveling this idea that it's okay to ask for help. You know, so often, you know, this societal need and a human need to have a family, and sometimes it is, you know, becomes urgent for people to do this, and they go into it, and then they're they're sitting there going, oh my gosh, you know what? And, and it's supposed to be once the transaction's over, the child's home, all you need is love. And then all of a sudden there's, there are disruptions or there's heavy duty stuff that goes on. And you're going, I, I, I can't go back for help. Like this is what I wanted. And then you find instances where families are overwhelmed. And, 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 and we haven't really been a great society of, hey, if you're having a problem as a parent, we got you. We'll, we'll help you. You know, that's called the child welfare system, and you don't want to be anywhere near that if you can help it. So how do we? And, you know, there's a class, a class thing that goes on there. If you have means, you can send your kid to the best psychologist. But if you're not in a space and time to be able to, to do that, um, you're faced with some serious, serious challenges. So it's education at first. It's really understanding that all families need help. And we know some of the areas that may be of, 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 of concern and challenge for us. So we've got to be opening that door and then providing the services for families when, when, when we know that, that they, they could need them. You're welcome. Hi. Um, our daughter is four, and we still are in contact with her birth mother. Uh, we don't know anything about her birth father. And, and we want to be able to give more information to our daughter about her birth families. Do you have any advice on, on getting the birth mother maybe to, to open up more about those issues? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I, I love that you're in touch and you're creating this um, space for your daughter. It's, it's transformational. It's, um, it's hard work, but I am grateful that you're doing it on behalf of your daughter. Uh, you know, people, I think, I think it's all about relationships. I think that's the first, you know, trust and um, the mutual love that you have for your daughters and, and her healthy identity development, which you wouldn't be in this situation if you both didn't have that. Um, it's a, a really, that's the vehicle for, I think, over time, um, getting to more information. Now, traditionally, birth fathers have been completely left out of the, I mean, I, I'm, I'm almost certain that my birth father, I don't know him I, in the world, he's somewhere, but I, I'm almost certain that he didn't know. So it's, um, 
that's a really hard piece to get. It's, again, broader societal issues um, when it comes to this. So I would say creating that relationship and that space on behalf of your daughter and creating that trust so that there's at certain point you know, maybe an idea that there's an opening for that. Um, but it also goes back to then the facts. Your job now is to raise your daughter and protect her and, and set her up for success. If we don't have information, um, that's harder to do. So there's like the factual side of things. So I think if you balance both like the, the, the real kind of um, information um, and then the relationship, because she may or may not, you may or may not over time um, want to have a relationship um, it's not, it make it clear, I think, that this is not always about a relationship. Not everybody wants that relationship. It'll, that'll be up to your daughter. You're going to raise her with the ability to do that. You're not going to have her with this divided loyalty. She may then be able to make these decisions with your blessing, which is so beautiful. But she may decide, I just want to know this. I don't want to do that. And maybe a year from then, she'll want to know him. So, but getting to that place with her birth mom would be the starting place so that there's, you know, some, some flow to this that doesn't just come out of left field. And you're already doing that. You're, you're, you're already working your way towards that right now. You just maybe don't even know it, right? So just keep it up and then ask the questions when, you know, you feel ready. And, and ask them again. If, you know, no today could be yes um, depending on life circumstances. I know. Thank you. There are a lot more questions, but we are at the end of our hour. And today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a Friday forum with April Dinwiddie, Chief Executive of the Donaldson Adoption Institute, DAI. Community partners for our forum today include the Adoption Network, Adoption Network Cleveland and Fostering Hope. We thank you very much for your partnership. Additionally, we welcome guests at tables hosted by Lakeland Community College. We thank you all for being here. That brings us to the end of our forum today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Mr. Woody. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund.